Thank you all for joining me this afternoon. My name is Nikki Johnson, and I work in the business development group at Wolfram Alpha. I do a lot of educational outreach to teachers, both at the secondary level and at the higher ed level. Um, we talk a lot about ways that teachers can use Wolfram Alpha and Wolfram Technologies, and we also work with some educational content providers as partners um, and look for ways to work with them. So this afternoon, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, not only mobile technologies, but we're going to talk about kind of the Wolfram technologies as a whole. So we're going to go through kind of a history of educational technologies and, and talk about some of the major milestones. And then we're going to look at where we are today in terms of classroom technology. And then we, of course, will wrap it up with how you can use some of the Wolfram technologies in your classroom. So before we get started, I want you to take a look at this quote. So it says, books will soon be obsolete in schools. Scholars will soon be instructed through the eye. This sounds pretty relevant, right? We hear this all the time now. Such and such school gave every incoming freshman an iPad. This high school is moving away from textbooks and they're going to use digital online course materials. The really interesting thing about this quote is that this came from Thomas Edison in 1925. So. <laughs> You know, you think that right now we're just starting to transition to digital materials and transform the way that students learn in the classroom, but I bring this up only to show you that this has been something that every generation has struggled with, is how do we make the content that we're providing our students relevant and help them learn in the ways that they feel most comfortable and are most successful. So as I said, we're going to take a quick tour through some of the key educational milestones, and some of you may recognize some of these. Some of you will have no idea what some of these are. So 1650 gave us the horn book. Looks maybe a little bit similar to the iPad, same size, same, uh, same basic idea. I don't know, maybe they were onto something. 1870, we got the magic lantern. This was an early film projector of sorts. You could look at you know, small transparencies, kind of like those little clickable viewfinders that you can look through. Then in 1890, we got the chalkboard. And the really interesting thing about the chalkboard is it, of course, is still the number one educational technology used in classrooms. So this guy has survived longer than anyone in the classroom. And I guess it's pretty effective. You know, It's definitely not the way that um, teachers say that they want to teach, but it is the way that they oftentimes end up teaching. 1925, we got the film projector, and this brought, you know, the days of the teachers who didn't want to plan a lesson. You just flip the p film projector on, and it will do the teaching for you. So that was a big uh, advancement in educational technology. Then we got the overhead projector. And this, of course, is just about, it's pretty close to being one of the top educational technologies. I think it was actually number two still today. You know, teachers, you walk into any classroom, they've got their overhead projector, they're using their uh, transparencies and dry erase markers. 1950, we got the slide rule. So this was a huge advancement for math instruction. 1950, this one scares me a little bit. 1957, the reading accelerator. This was supposed to hold the book and allow students to only focus on the bits of content at a time so as not to overwhelm them. I don't know, I mean, it's not too hard to hold a book, but this thing did it for you. 1958, educational television came along. So then again, teachers could just flip on the channel and the TV would do the teaching for them. 1959 brought the copy machine. So this kind of goes along with the overhead projector and the endless piles of transparencies and worksheets and handouts that still overwhelm a lot of our students today and parents. 1970, we got the handheld calculator, obviously a huge milestone in math instruction. 1980, the Play-Doh computer. And this wasn't just any computer. Some of you are probably familiar with this. This was a computer that was designed around curriculum and instruction. And one interesting piece is that this was actually developed at the University of Illinois here in Champaign. 1985 brought us the graphing calculator. 1999, this is where we start seeing some huge advances in technology. We got the interactive whiteboard. So you can see that big gap between the 80s when it was kind of the handheld analog type things and then now of course the rapid developments in 1999, the interactive whiteboard. 
And of course, last year we got the iPad, which what's interesting about the iPad, as I'm sure most of you, especially those of you who teach know, it wasn't exactly renowned as an educational technology breakthrough when it was released. A lot of people didn't know how they were going to use it. They didn't know what it was going to be used for. But, you know, ourselves included, the, keep developing content at a very rapid pace that's geared towards schools and teachers and students. So since we've kind of looked at where we came from, I think it's important to consider where we are now. So, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you could see those huge gaps in technology. And now, and I say current state, this is actually the U.S. Department of Education's data that was released last year, which was from their 2008 survey. So it's probably not quite accurate. I would assume that some of these are quite a bit higher than this now, but it's interesting to look at anyway. So 100% of U.S. public schools have at least one computer with Internet access. The student to computer ratio is 3.1 to 1. 97% of classrooms have projectors, which is impressive when you consider the year that that came about. 73% uh, have interactive whiteboards of some sort. 39% uh, of public schools have a wireless network for the whole school. And I think that one's really interesting because a lot of schools want to go to these one-to-one -one initiatives or they want to let their students use their cell phones or they want to let them use iPads, but when you look at the numbers of schools that have a whole school wireless network, it's not quite up to par yet. And then 91% of computers in public schools are used for instructional purposes. So of course, are we making progress? And I think everyone ag would agree that absolutely we're making progress. You know, never before had so, have so many students had personal access. And I think that's the biggest difference is everywhere you go, students got their cell phones. You know, they live on the tech same technology that instructs them and delivers their educational content. It, you know, you didn't see students carrying their graphing calculators with them when they went shopping. Or you didn't see, you know, students having overhead projectors at home. It's only been recently that students have been able to take the class, same technologies that they use in the classroom home with them. So I think the biggest challenge that we face now is not giving them the technology, but staying he ahead of how they're using the technology and the way they use the technology. I'm going to show you a quick video that I think really demonstrates this. So some of you may have seen this. It was kind of a viral video last week. Turn up the volume. This is a one-year-old obviously playing with their iPad. It doesn't work. She has to check it on her leg, you know, does my finger actually work? <coughs> so I think that's pretty telling about not only you know what this baby is doing, but about how our students and the next generation of students are going to learn in the classroom. I mean, this baby already expects everything to have a touch interface. If you gave the baby a keyboard, she would have no idea what to do with it. She doesn't know that the commands come from typing the keys. And I think that's what a lot of classrooms really struggle with is, yes, we have the technology, but how do we make it relevant to the students? So it's not only having it, but it's making it relevant and making sure that we stay ahead of the way that students prefer to use technology. So now we're going to talk about, of course, some of the Wolfram technologies and how we can use some of these. And how many of you know what this thing is? <laughs> this is a QR code. These are 2D barcodes, and they were made famous by marketers everywhere because they love them, and they started showing up you know, on all sorts of things. Um, what I like to show, I like to show this example because teachers love these. What you can do with these is, if you ha does anybody have a QR code reader on your phone? If you've got one, go ahead and take a picture of it. And I'll show you here in a minute what it does for you. 
But basically, what you do is you download a free code reader, which most of your students probably already have these on their smartphones. You can use these at the front of the classroom, or you can use these on worksheets. You know, say, during the, the math period, you gave a lesson on derivatives, which happens to be what this one is about. I'll show you. This is actually what you would get on your mobile device if you scan that code. So let's say you taught your, your uh, lesson on derivatives, and the girl at the back of the classroom had just broke up with her boyfriend, and she wasn't paying attention to a word you were saying, and the guy sitting next to her was finishing his paper for the next, the next class period, and so he gets home and he's like, I have no idea how to do my derivatives homework. Well, instead of you know, calling a friend and copying the homework or you know, looking at the back of the book, you can embed or put these little QR codes onto your homework assignments that, or your worksheets that you're handing out, or you can send them in your class notes, your PowerPoint presentations, whatever you want to do, as kind of little hints and tips and reminders for students on how to complete the topics that you covered. So I think those are a pretty powerful tool, and even better is that Wolfram Alpha creates these. So I showed you this query right here, the derivative of x to the fourth sine of x. If we just simply insert ahead of that QR code, actually, there you go. Wolfram Alpha has then generated a QR code that matches that query. So these are really easy to generate um, from within Wolfram Alpha itself, and they're becoming a pretty powerful educational tool. A lot of the teachers that I talk to say they love these things because they're an easy way to direct students to the topics that they want them to look at. So some of you who were in the Birds of a Feather session yesterday heard us talk a little bit about widgets. Widgets are another really powerful Wolfram Alpha tool that you can use in the classroom, and I'm going to show you here um, a few examples. All you need to create these is a Wolfram ID, which if you have a mathematical license, you've got one of these already. Uh, this example is for heart disease risk. So, as I said, these are very targeted Wolfram Alpha queries, and you can build these, or you can search through the gallery. You'll see up here it says gallery. There's something like 6,000 widgets already built. Um, and I should note that the widget gallery is open to everyone, so if you're going to use a widget make sure you, in your classroom, make sure you test it ahead of time because some people publish things that aren't really, they're not finished, they're a little bit broken, so um, just make sure you test it or you can build your own. But in this case, the widget author created a heart disease risk calculator. So you could change the variables, let's say you know you wanted to change the age, and submit that. So then you can choose how these results come back to you as well. This one comes in a separate pop-up window. But then you get the Wolfram Alpha results that are relative to that query. And a lot of my math teachers that I talk to love widgets because they take them and they build them for the topics that they're discussing in their class, but when you build a widget, you can actually control the result pods that come back to you. So instead of getting all of the steps and all of the answers and everything that you don't want your students to see while they're working through a problem, you could hide the answer so that they only get the steps. Or you could just, I mean, if you wanted to, you could just show them the answer and hide the steps. So there's a way um, for you to control kind of the results that come back from Wolfram Alpha in the classroom setting. Do a couple more examples of these. Here's a pressure calculator. We can just change these variables. Again, click Submit. This one's a little different. You'll see the styling differences. This is all personal preference when you build them. This one pops up in a light box, gives you the results. And then the derivative solver again. So we can change our variables, submit the input, and you get your output. And of course, like I said, this one, uh, this author did elect to show the steps. You could control that so that did not come back if you didn't want your students to see that. So those are pretty powerful tools, um, and they are actually, I'll show you real quick, uh, pretty easy to build. I'm going to build a pretty simple one for you. So you just sign in with your Wolfram ID, and then you go over here, new widget, and I'm going to build the same one I build every demonstration. <laughs> Let's do... Calories in a carrot. And I apologize, this is a pretty simple example, but it works well for the presentation. So we put the query in just like we would in a normal Wolfram Alpha query. Um, we try it. 
and we like this. So we like the results that it, it gives back to us, so let's use it. So when we use it, now we have our template editor. So I want my students to be able to calculate the calories in any type of food. So I'm going to make the carrot a variable. I'm going to make that our new variable. And we're going to make that an input field so they can type in whatever they want. And we're going to go to next. I'm just running through this real quickly so you can see how easy and unintimidating it is to actually make one of these. We can give it a title. We're going to call it a calorie counter. You can change your colors if your school colors are red. Um, and then there are many more options down here for editing and personalizing these. And here is where you can control the output that comes back to you. So if you want to include all of the output, you would select this option. If you want to only include specific output, this is where you can select the pods. So again, if you, in the math examples, you could limit that information. I'm going to go back up and actually show all of our input or output. Hit next. And I have it set to come up as a light box so students don't have to get the pop-ups blocked or anything like that. We submit our query. And now you have a widget for your class. So these are really good. You can create several of them to match up with lesson plans, or you can sift through the gallery. They're organized by various topics. A lot of, especially in the math areas, they're already created. So you can just sift through and pick the ones that match what you're attempting to accomplish. So the next tool, classroom tool, that we have in terms of mobile technology is our course assistant apps. And I'm going to switch screens here real quick. Some of you saw these when Steven did his demonstration and may have seen these in some of the other talks as well. But I want to do a quick demo. So the course assistant apps, we have, as Steven mentioned, I think there's 15 or so right now. But the goal is to make an app for every course. So this is the Algebra one. And they are built off of a, a textbook. So they follow kind of the same flow as a textbook would. Um, we're going to take a quick tour of this one real quick because this gives a good overview of what you can get out of the widget. So this is algebra, of course. Start at the beginning of this tour. So you can put in um, an, a specific expression. You can plot the parametric equation. Here you go. You can graph. Obviously, these are much prettier than graphing calculators. Students tend to love the interface. Um, plus, they get to use them on an iPod, iPad or iPod Touch or their phones. So this is just an example of several of the things you can do with the course assistants. And if you're interested in purchasing these as a teacher, um, you, of course, get them through the iTunes store. But Apple has a specific purchase program for schools and teachers to buy um, enterprise copies of these. And I have the web address right here. But it's apple.com slash iTunes slash education. And you can buy them at half off. Basically, you purchase a voucher, and then you can use that. You can redeem that voucher for whatever apps you want to use in your classroom. So it saves you quite a bit of money if you want to deploy these across your class. All right, and a few other resources I want you to be aware of before you head out today. Obviously, we have the course assistant apps, but we have also the Wolfram Alpha app that you can get for your students um, on Android. It's also available on the Amazon App Store in the Google Android market and for the Nook, the Barnes & Noble Nook, um, iPod, iPod Touch, iPhone, and iPad. Um, course Assistant apps, there you can see the full course listing that we've got right now, but these release all the time. So if we don't have what you want at the moment, keep checking back. Reference apps, if you want to focus on some of that specific content in the class you're teaching, and then the professional and personal assistant apps. Wolfram Alpha for educators. This is another great resource. This is where you can watch some videos of teachers and students using Wolfram Alpha in the classroom, get some ideas on how you can integrate some of this stuff. Um, and over here, we have a lesson plan collection. So you can sift through some lesson plans that teachers and some of us at Wolfram have created based on your subject and topic areas. And it gives you ideas of how to integrate Wolfram Alpha queries into the lessons that you're teaching um, and use like some of the QR codes and things like that that we talked about earlier. 
So, and you can, of course, share your own lesson plans if you want to give us some of your information as well. And there, there's a community here also if you want to chat with other um, educators about what you're working on. And then we didn't talk a lot about Mathematica today, um, but there is the Learning Center for Educators. If you're looking for resources on how to further integrate Mathematica into your classroom, just go over here, select Education and the area that you're in, and you'll find lots of resources there. So any of those addresses you want to copy down, this will be available, obviously, in the slides for download afterwards. All right. Thank you very much.